So my name is Jackie Mwanza. I am the founder of Ubuntu Museum and Ubuntu Museum is a social enterprise and we are on a mission to sort of explore uh, cultural inclusion within the arts, education and commerce. And today we're going to be looking at recycled art uh, in the context of African artists and African traditions. When I was a child, we used to play in the streets with my friends, and we used to have these uh, cars. I don't have one here, but this is the closest to it. And these cars are sort of made of recycled wire, and you know, you see the little wheels there. And they actually even had like a proper axle, so you know, you could turn left or right, and they're just so much fun. You could play with them for hours and hours and hours. I mean, although there's many of the boys who played with the cars, we played with them as well. And one of my um, favorite ones was my sister made these eyeglasses with wire and she put plastic over them. And I just love that so much. That was one of my favorites as well. I think today, I mean, I come from Zambia, there's a bit of background. I come from Zambia and uh, possibly lots of African countries' children have this experience of playing with toys from from scraps or quite made sophisticated because this is quite a sophisticated piece of, uh, sort of engineering. If you look at the wheels, they actually work properly. I mean, the, the cyclist is pedaling and that's what sort of allows the drums to be beaten. So even though they're toys, they're quite sort of well made. These are recycled art and crafts made from cans. And I used to run a business uh, from 2008 to 2011. I had a market store at Spitterfield, and I used to import these, some of these items from Zimbabwe. These ones in particular, giraffes made from cans. This is a Coca-Cola giraffe. Yeah, so this giraffe is made out of recycled wire as the frame, and then wrapped with a Coca-Cola can. And uh, it's made by artisans in Zimbabwe. And I kind of like the relationship between the sort of Africa and the West, you know, with the commercial, the Coca-Cola, and obviously our natural uh, heritage, the, the, the wildlife and all. So this gecko is made out of cans as well. I don't recognize this can, but I remember when I first started selling the geckos at the market, people would ask me, well, what would I do with it? And then I realized I have to actually put some advertising out to so I, I put a little nail on the wall and hooked it on. I said, well, you can you know, display it on the wall. So people kind of, you know, you have to, commercially, you have to kind of still sell it on the product. So. And this elephant I actually made myself. Um, there was a time when uh, my supply chain was a bit, you know, uh, challenging. So I didn't have any stock to sell. And I remember I actually had an elephant. I copied this from a template of an elephant I actually bought in Namibia. So I opened it up, uh, yeah, and I managed to make it. So it was a cheaper way for me to make stuff. And yeah, I didn't have to worry about it coming from abroad. Mobiles, this is an aeroplane mobile. This is a mobile made out of an aerosol can. And I remember, actually it came in, um, it was a mobile of five planes, but that was quite expensive for some of the clients and I, sort of separated the planes and, you know, did individual ones as well to, you know, especially during Christmas time, people wanting to buy presents for, for children. The brooch was also from a template from um, a, a flower I bought in Namibia, but I actually adapted it and put a little leaf on it, this Carlsberg leaf, and a little hook at the back so you could actually put it on your lapel. It's actually a new product I created. And obviously the commercial world being what it is, you have to be quite savvy about seasonal sales. So at Christmas time, I came up with this idea of having a ball ball made out of cans. It's actually a template, underneath the template is polystyrene ball. And I remember specifically they cost me uh, 28 pence to make and I sold them for five pounds each. It's quite a good profit. And I also did the same for Easter time. I made little Easter eggs and stuff. And if you wonder how I uh, managed to drink all these, um, <laughs> these drinks, I mean, I don't even drink fizzy drinks. I do drink a bit of beer sometimes, not that much. Um, I actually got approached by a company 
that uh, makes the cans, uh, makes the cans for, uh, produces the cans for, for bottling or whatever it is, you know. And they uh, commissioned me to make a piece, a 2D piece, for an auction they were having. And so they sent me this huge box of cans without the rims on top, which made it easy for me. Otherwise, I used to just go to restaurants and ask them to keep cans for me, or friends to keep cans for me. So yeah, or sometimes I used to raid people's recycling bins, which was not very good. I got, yeah, I got chewed away a few times. So yes, I. <laughs> Alan Atsui was born in Ghana in 1944. Um, he studied art at college and uh, his education was very Eurocentric. So at that time, uh, Ghana was uh, a British colony. And he felt, so after Ghana got its independence, he felt that um, why wasn't African art considered as important as well? You know, this is his, his art from his people. So he decided to go move to Nigeria to study with a group of artists uh, called the Nsuka Group. And yeah, so they were sort of focusing and looking into African artists. Yeah. He then became a professor at the University of Nigeria, uh, a sculpture professor. And this is some of his famous work. Uh, he uses recycled materials, um, in particular bottle tops from whiskey bottles, and creates these huge quilts. Um, one of them covered the front of the Royal Academy, um, maybe about 10 years ago, don't quote me on this, but they, they're quite amazing. And uh, here is another image of his work. He did exhibit at the British Museum and uh, the, the Italian biennial, is it, is it Venice biennial? Yeah. yeah. So as I mentioned previously that I got uh, a lot of cans from a can manufacturer uh, to do a 2D piece of artwork. So I started exploring how to actually put cans onto a 2D surface. And uh, I use these little pins, uh, they're called panel pins I think, yeah, so I use these cut out the cans and then put them with a pin pusher into uh, into the MDF. This particular piece is called Nouveau Blonde Brit and it came about uh, in 2011. I saw this call out for artists uh, for competition and it was uh, before the 2012 Olympics. This is 2012 Olympics can which I found. I made a little brooch from it. And the competition was for an artist to design uh, the planes that were going to be taking the athletes, you know, bringing them into, into London and all that stuff. So I, I put in a, my bid, I, you know, I did this design on the plane. And whilst I'm doing my research, I, I was always coming across the Virgin planes, you know, with Richard Branson, uh, with the girls, you know, flying on top of them. And two of the models was, one of them was Kate Moss. And when she was put on the plane, they did this campaign with her. And then there was another burlesque dancer, Dita Van Tees, and she did that as well. And I was wondering to myself, hmm, I wonder if you'd ever have a black woman on the plane. And that sort of came about because, well, historically in advertising, we don't see a lot of, well, now we do, but when I was growing up, uh, I'm a child of the 70s, I was born in the 70s. When I was growing up, you just rarely so black women or black people on TV and advertising. So I thought, ah, oh, um, why don't I make my own, you know? So this is my own um, virgin, black virgin girl. <laughs> yeah, so I called her Nouveau Blonde, but at the time I was actually blonde myself. This is a picture of me, blonde. <laughs> so it did, yeah, so that was me and with the Union Jack on the virgin plane. Yeah, that's how this came about. Ella Natsui's philosophy. Art grows out of each particular situation, and I believe that artists are better off working with whatever their environment throws up. I don't think that working with prescribed materials would be very interesting to me. Industrial produced colors for painting, for example. I believe that color is inherent in everything, and that you are better off picking something which relates to your circumstances and your environment than going to buy ready-made color. This is called the flying elephants, and these are the elephants there. And this was sort of inspired by images, uh, again, sort of to do with religion. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, photographs taken um, of the sky or the sea, of nature mainly, and there's some Bible passages put on, you know, on the side. I, I kind of used to like those 
images as a child, but they kind of annoy me now, and that was kind of an ode to that. Yeah, that's what it's about. And today I used the Stella Tuacan San Pellegrino, and this is uh, Cronenberg, I think. Yeah, that's what it's about. And I want to talk about other work uh, I continue to do with uh, recycled material. Um, yeah, because of the time as well, I sort of wasn't working very much, and I really and I had all these resources, the cans and stuff. Started collecting lots of plastics, plastic mill bottle. I literally just didn't throw anything away. I had lots of storage. I had a, a workspace, and um, uh, when I went back to visit uh, Namibia, where my mother lives, I I had some time. I spent some time with her. I spent a whole year there, and. I wanted to start working again, so I picked up all these different recycled materials. One of them was plastic bottles, and I did this project um, with my nephew, and the title of the exhibition we finally did together was Black Madonna and the Bastard Child. Um, now, um, I'll just explain the Bastard Child bit. Uh, my nephew is mixed race. And the word basta in Namibia means uh, mixed race, but it's quite derogatory. Although, interestingly, the people um, themselves have have kind of uh, embraced the word. It's not. It's not. The, the the power of the word has changed. So. Uh, my perspective obviously would be different because I don't come from that group of people. Um, and Black Madonna was sort of referring to myself because this is my, me and my nephew doing this exhibition, Black Madonna and the Bastard Child. And I was very interested in the images of Black Madonna. Um, the Black Madonna is a sort of Christian uh, Christendom image which is in sculptures and paintings all over Europe. There are about 500 Black Madonnas all over Europe. And I find that very interesting that, uh, and I, I saw a documentary and one of the priests in the church was explaining that, oh no, the black, it doesn't mean that obviously Madonna and Jesus were black. It means about, it's talking about their sorrow. But um, that intrigues me a lot. And I started doing a little bit of research. I'm looking at literature addressing the question about whether people of African descent were present in biblical history. And, why, and whether they are part of the Israelite community in the Bible. So uh, this is another thing of this experience of African and Western and yeah, so just exploring that within that piece of artwork. So this piece, the original title was I Am Alive, but I only kind of got around to doing the I Am. And um, it was because I've done all the flowers, the flowers I showed you earlier, for the ones I was selling. Um, I kind of wanted to do something more with them instead of them just being a little commercial piece to sell. I made some bouquet as well with these ones, so I kind of put these together in a wreath form, like you know the wreaths you see at funerals and stuff. But yeah, it was just a sort of like a celebration of life and death, and. Uh, yeah, and it's quite intricate. I mean, I don't know, I can show you the back, the way I put everything together at the back. So, and the best thing about working with metal, so I just so I put the wires, these are most, mostly coat hangers, so recycled coat hangers, uh, the wire coat hangers. And I made a frame for all of them. And uh, they're quite strong. Working with these materials was that they're not really precious, and I like that kind of quality of something that I got for free and it's not so precious. It also reminds me of the idea of like why art is so expensive. Like Ella Natsui, the artist we talked about, the Ghanaian artist we talked about earlier, um, he, his pieces are all from recycled material. Uh, but I think uh, in the early 2000s, his piece one of his quilts went for, his quilt sculptures went for half a million pounds at Bonhams. That was the most expensive an African artist had sold a piece for. And I'm interested in that relationship with putting value on something that's, and the commercial value of course is only for the few very wealthy people. 
what's the purpose of art in that context? And uh, I like the fact that with these materials and the way I feel about art, I think it's important for me that it educates rather than it's, it's a maybe trophy for wealthy people. But yeah, that's just sort of my thought about that. But I like the fact that I'm not precious about this. And if anybody wanted to display it somewhere, they can, they can come and they can throw it about. And it's fine, it's just a piece of metal at the end of the day. If you can tell a story and educate people, that's great, but I don't see why somebody should have it in their home and, you know, make it something that you need to do. I don't know whether it's very necessary or not. And in relation to preciousness of work, uh, Ella Natsui, who we spoke about earlier, uh, one of the things with his, his pieces and displaying them is that he, when they're packed, delivered to the gallery, they're all like in flat, they're folded over and, you know, packed in a box. When they arrive at the gallery, it's actually up to the curator to hang it however they want to hang it. So they're kind of co-creating the final display of the work. And he said uh, some of the galleries are daunted by that idea, like, oh my God, what if, you know, what if. And most of the time, I think maybe 90% of the time, he'd go in and think, yeah, it looks great. I mean, uh, apparently a few times he's gone in and said, okay, mm, doesn't work very well. But in most cases, he allows the artists, the, the curators to take part. I remember one of the documentaries curator was saying that because of the way the work is put together, it's all little copper wires uh, attaching all these pieces. Sometimes some of the pieces fall out and he doesn't really mind. He says, well, that's the piece. The piece is changing as it's going to different environments. So I like that idea that he also doesn't, you know, the preciousness, you know, not he allows his piece to be organic. So when people come to Africa, uh, or when, normally when I've run workshops with children and ask them, what's the first thing when you think about Africa? I think, oh, elephants, you know, lions, whatever. And I think there's an expectation of tourists when they come to Africa that they're going to see that. And uh, that sort of tells them a story of Africa. Yes, this is true. You know, you find these animals there. And then uh, as children, when I was a child, we played with those toys of cars. Okay, yeah, we did have a car, you know, my parents who came from middle class family and even poor people did see cars. So, you know, that became part of our world. That was part of our world and is still part of our world. And um, I was thinking that if I was a child now in my country playing with wire toys, what would I make? And one of the things I thought of was a keyboard. So I made this keyboard some years ago. So this is a QWERTY keyboard, like a computer keyboard. So I was thinking, oh, maybe today I'd make that. I mean, I haven't been to the, the markets and seen anything like that, but that was just sort of my thought as a toy. And also um, the way in which I would like to also do some research on the first, I mean, trade has always happened between Africa and Europe and Africa and the rest of the world for centuries now. We know the slave trade with uh, alcohol, uh, trading with slaves, and there were also uh, cottons, materials being traded, shells being traded. And I kind of wonder when something like this would have come in. You know, somebody made this waistcoat from cans because there's a tradition of making stuff from recycled materials in Africa, and actually in Asia as well, but we'll talk about Africa now, this baseball cap. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to sort of, uh, and then this chicken, this is interesting. I mean, <laughs> I grew up, my, my grandmother um, lived on a farm and, you know, we had lots of chickens. This is made out of, uh, you know, when you buy the cans of Coca-Cola and they're wrapped up in this plastic, that's what that's made of. Yeah, so what story of, of Africa are these sort of items telling? And uh, I'm glad that I was, I've been able to explore working with cans and with recycled materials. Let's say they're cheap to acquire. And as Ella Natsui says, why not use stuff that's there, easily accessible and in your environment? And we know waste at the moment is a big issue. So yes, uh, I like to use these materials also because they do tell a story about Africa too.
and which is part of my story. And uh, yes.